welcome to the Wild Wild Podcast, and this is me, Miles Irving. And we're taking a slightly different approach to the podcast from this week. At least we're going to experiment with with doing that. Because um, I said from the outset, the the podcast was really a way of documenting conversations that I would have anyway. So I'm trying to remove all trace of it being, you know, a contrivance for the podcast and. Um, You'll sort of see that the the, the uh, well, well we're going to have an interesting job editing this one because um, I kind of stumbled into just not really starting the podcast when I when uh, I got talking to this week's guest Tamar and then we never did sort of formally start it so Joel's got an interesting job I, I'm not sure at this point having not heard the edit whether whether he's going to um, just run it from the start or find a way of of um, editing it at some point a couple of minutes in anyway the thing is that um we're just going for that more um genuine documenting of the conversation so we'll see how that goes i'm, I'm hoping it's going to just make the conversations better really that, that i've removed all efforts to primarily you know think about it in terms of an audience so that i can just settle into the conversation and, and um and do what i set out to do in the first place which is which is just to capture the the actual engagement that i have with people um and in this case this week's guest tama matsuoka wong is um someone i met at the man symposium a few years ago in copenhagen the first one i think it was in in 2013 or whenever it was um and we put our heads together and did a lot of thinking about what foragers could be doing together and and um and actually, I haven't spoken to her since, which I get kind of berated for in the course of this conversation. But it does kind of mean that we are actually facilitating conversations that that should be happening, that aren't happening as as well through the through the podcast. So so that's a good thing. So anyway, just to introduce Tamar, she's an amazing forager working in New York and working with the chefs Daniel Bollard and Eddie Larue. These are guys I don't actually know, but but she's worked very closely with them to basically find a, a an out. Well, she has found an outlet for the forage stuff that she works with, and those guys have worked to find um, how to include those plants in, into their menus. So she's got an amazing book called Foraged Flavor, which she co-wrote with Eddie Larue, which is full of recipes and um, kind of there's a seasonal aspect to the book, which shows what's available in each of the, each of the seasons. So that's a great reference book, and it's a lot of the plants are actually um, the kind of global weed species like chickweed and dock. So you know, pretty much wherever you are, you could you could find some use. And um, because of Tamar's um, Asian roots, there's a lot of Asian influence in the in the recipes. And also, as you'll find out from the podcast, she's doing some very interesting work with farmers and looking at changes of land use where the things previously viewed as as um problem and uh, you know plants known as weeds are now being not just utilized but celebrated and and there's a lot of people um changing just changing how they see land and biodiversity anyway that's kind of preempting the conversation but she's doing a lot of work in that area too so yeah that's 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 all i have to say i think by way of introduction so we'll get on to the conversation yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of doing a few different. Like, I need. I'm. I'm planning to get a diary for this year coming, and, and just have a diary that is nothing but what I cook. So, you know, because I always cook something. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just like I put a leaf on cheese on toast that I never did before, and it might be boring, but I'll still write it down. I'll say, well, I put this leaf on a cheese on toast, and it didn't work at all, or something. <laughs> But at least I'll have a record of the fact that I did that because I'll forget. I won't remember that. Um, so, and then yeah, and then as you say, you, you other other thoughts. But the thing the thing about this is also quite interesting from a personal thing because I now have a record of of, of thought processes, you know. And, and you talk to people yeah. who change what you think. That's the, I mean, I think yeah. Every week, so we're knocking this out once a week now. Which, which okay. Is, committed to doing and it's quite exciting because it means we're quickly building up quite a body of work yeah every week the person i talk to changes my thinking about something mm-hmm. and i think it's really it's really interesting to whether it's just i'm better informed but it's usually i've got some slight misapprehension that that is uh mm-hmm. corrected by somebody that, that's worked more closely with something than i have or, mm-hmm. or thinking about things in a different way 
So it's it's actually a personal document, really. It's a bit like having a journal, but it's a journal of of conversations. So could you catch me up with, you know, everything that's happening with you, like everything? You mean since, like, I don't know what year that was, 2013 maybe? I think so, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, a lot since then. I, then I was just like didn't even, you know, remember? I All I remember, one of the things I remember is that there's all these, like, chefs running around and – they were like, oh, we've invited you guys or something. And then you said to Daniel Patterson, next time we're going to have a foragers retreat and maybe we'll invite a few chefs. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's good. <laughs> you said that was good. <laughs> you just kind of like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you do sometimes feel like you're staff, don't you? Do you know what I mean? If you understand that, what I mean by that. So, do you know what I mean? You've got the, yes, 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 the important yes. people and then, then you've got staff. Yes. And the foragers are staff. Yeah. But, but, or the supplier, right? I mean, yeah. that's part of like, I think that's part of what I think is sort of, in, you know, interesting just in the way that food and food supply is that you have the people who are kind of like the creators or whatever, the gods or goddesses, and then you have the suppliers. So you come up with this and then, oh, these other people are just your suppliers or purveyors, right? Yeah. When yeah. actually... I mean, at least the way I think foragers are working, because what we're doing is not, it's less commoditized. It's, it's more, at least for me, it's more of a relationship where there's things that are happening and that's changing. And so it's a more of a dialogue and it's less of, I've just ticked something off. A, I mean, yeah, there are some lists, but there, it's more than that. It's more than just ordering something from a distributor. That's certainly the way that we, we want to work. Um, I mean, I looked at your website and saw that you you have this thing where people are basically signing up to uh, a collaborative thing with you with minimum orders. And, and it, yeah, I think, and I know Thomas, um, he, he has that with people. He says, look, you've got to get all your wild food from me. Otherwise I'm not dealing with you. you can't oh. so, so mine isn't really like that. So the way I, it's, it's oh. more just like our own, we have so much demand. We have too much demand. And so, it's a couple of things. So it's, it's that we just can't even, we need to be able to fulfill people who are really committed, you know, and who really want to work with things. And just, we don't have enough bandwidth, you know, New York city, which is where I'm, it's huge. And the territory is huge and the traffic is huge. So there's only so much we can just physically do as a small company. Yeah. So it's better to work with people that aren't the kind of, Either they know what they're doing or they're committed to knowing what they're doing. And they're not just like, oh, I just want to order a couple things as a garnish or something. Do you know what I mean? Like they're really going to work with you to make something that maybe somebody hasn't thought of before. Like you said, they've done a leaf, but they've made that leaf into something amazing. So it's more of that. It's more like our bandwidth is not and, and what we're capable of doing. So it's just really practicalities of it for us. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, we're in a slightly different position because we've got lots of um, there's lots of foraging suppliers now where we are. So we 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 are um, in quite a competitive market. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of um, yeah, there are a lot of other people who are um, have you know kind of like distributors have things. Um, there's a big, big mushroom business. I'd say mushrooms are almost commoditized to some point, you know, but. Um, we're doing more unusual things. So I think, I don't know, we're in a little bit of a different position from that. And also, I mean, the other thing that we're doing is really tied directly to the land. So we're doing a lot of stewardship restoration practices. So it's not like we're just going around and picking something. We're, we're actually doing something to that contributes sustainably to stewardship. It's not just, oh, hi, I've got this thing. Is it this look cool? I mean, that's interesting. I guess if you were in different parts of the States, you'd have a reference point, which you probably don't have. And what, what I'm thinking of is most of the indigenous communities got completely wiped out didn't they, in, in New York State. Well, I do have some contacts with the indigenous communities that I source from at cost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I want to support them. And I think their stuff is great. But it's usually like one or two things. Right. But I'll buy in bulk from them and then introduce it to my clients. Yeah. But in terms of the actual, didn't didn't the, the the last remaining people from the tribes in that area actually just get yeah. shot off into so, a different state? So they're not they're not in they're not in New Jersey and they're not in New York State. Yes. 
Correct. So, I mean, like, whereas in California, there's all this amazing um, documentation and ongoing um, traditional practice around land management and stuff. You don't have that in New York State. No, but I do have contacts in California. I do source in from California as well. Yeah. But only on certain certain things, and especially in the winter where we don't have too much. We, can, we don't have a year-round, you know, harvesting season. So some of the things that I think that are happening, you know, aside from the business thing, if you want to talk about that more, but uh, the other thing which is happening like imminently, I'd say starting last year and definitely getting worse this year is that really the weather slash climate, it's really gotten to the past this tipping point. So small farmers or small, you know, sort of landowners are really having a lot of difficulty making ends meet because a lot it's been for us in the eastern part of the United States is very, very rainy. And when it rains, it's not just like a nice little, you know, umbrella drizzle. It's like a waterfall, like, like you know, yeah. so it's very hard and things get the ground just can't hold that. So for the last two years, farmers couldn't even it's like small farmers, but still farmers that have machinery couldn't even get into the fields. I mean, it's really, really bad in the Midwest. And then on the West Coast, they've had either it rain, so either it's pouring rain or it's drought kind of situation. So this is huge stress. And so I work with farmers. I forage things that they don't want on their lands, mostly organic farmers. And um, I also do source in some things for them. So it's more of a relationship and less of I'm just taking things. But I think up to now, at least in my mind, they kind of just looked at me as like, you know, Somebody that just comes, it's not, it's just kind of some strange stuff I'm doing. I don't know what they think. You know, either this Asian woman is picking things that Asians like to eat or, you know, Matsuoka, you're falling down. We don't have too many wheat lambs corners here. Like, oh, you're, never, you're not keeping up with getting rid of them, right? So it, it's more like that. But what I've noticed, Miles, is that over the last 12 months that the farmers are much more interested in knowing what's in my head, one, and what my markets want. So it's almost... In a way, it's kind of forcing change in thinking about. And then we went to this meeting, and before I just be kind of like this strange sideshow person on the side. I mean, at least that's how I viewed it myself. Okay, maybe, they, but I looked at that, and they'd all be talking, and I'd just be kind of like. But now people are coming up to me like I've been doing hay for years, can't do it anymore. You know, what are people? You know, what, do you think people are interested in local bee honey or you know, just like all this stuff? And that and and there's a community that's kind of forming. I even have people coming up to me in the gas station, our local gas station, like a, a farmer in overalls. He's like, "Hey, can like I have your card?" And I'm like, "What?" You know. So people, like, people are we're never never this interesting. It was just always kind of like this side thing. So I don't know if there's answers, but there's certainly a lot more communication going on in the community than has before, from what I can see. But you're linking that to the extreme weather disrupting what people normally do. And that they're... Yes, I do. I think so. And and also, okay, so I think it's partly the weather, definitely that changes, but also maybe the markets, you know, like you said, there's it's more competitive. You know, there's a lot of kind of big guys out there who can do price gouging. You know, there's a lot of stuff. And so people are looking for some kind of niche. They can't just, they can't. So they're looking for niche. So where before I was like, extreme niche now maybe it's becoming less extreme right i don't know it's interesting so that's what i would observe sort of in the you know in this part of in the united states at least i don't know how it is over there i don't think we right think, yeah i don't think we've got that ex extreme weather factor but in terms of the thing being normalized i think um that is definitely true and and the way i look at it is when we say normalized, I mean, I think that really is true because I think we are just moving things back to, to normality, like the, the, the kind of way that we do things now mm -hmm. with food and farming is really weird when you, when you think about it. It is just obscure and bizarre, you know, what, the effect that that has on everything. You know, it's crap mm -hmm. for us. It's crap for the soil. It's crap for biodiversity. It's... It's not even good for farmers. You know, I mean, where's the where's the job satisfaction in uh, mm -hmm. in this kind of industrial model? It's not, you know. Um, and of course, as we know, people have always eaten these plants, and, mm -hmm. and even farmers have eaten these plants. You know, yes. like 
any any pre industrial agriculture situation, there's mm -hmm. no way people wouldn't be eating their lamb's quarters as you call them or, or, or fat hen as we call them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no way they would see that this is a precious gift and 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 you of course you eat this until your other crop is ready. Mm -hmm. So I mean we we're, we're we're just like I guess we 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 we're, we're people that have honed in on a piece of information i.e. you can eat this stuff and and suddenly got all of this attention for it as if we'd done something profound. In actual fact we've done something so incredibly <laughs> well, commonplace. It's just it's so common sense. I mean Miles that's what drives me. It's so common sense, right? It's so common sense, but on the other hand, it, it does take labor. You know, I am a manual laborer. I am picking things, right? It does take manual labor, but people have, I also think that people have to got to get away at least from thinking that that's something bad. It's really, it, it's, it's actually quite rejuvenating. It's great. People just want to push a button, at least a lot of people, which want to push a button and they don't understand that actually you end up, you know, sort of losing yourself you losing yourself in in if that's all you're doing you know just, i just wonder like all the all the sort of mass movement around mindfulness and various different and and, and even going to the gym and yeah and yeah this whole gym thing which is now they're finding out isn't really that great like if you go to the gym for 45 minutes there's studies that's showing that your body just reverts right back to whatever you know well, you, office the, block mode after and the trouble is that all you're doing is a different kind of engaging with a machine. That's what you've been doing all day. Yeah. And 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 this is now yes. interacting physically with a machine. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Whereas 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 good old fashioned work. I know. You get exercise and mindfulness. I mean, if you want to talk about you know, yes. people being in, being in your body, you know, being present in your body. Well, you know, go out and pick something. And then come back home and process that. That's being in your body. I mean, I, you know, for me, like cooking is is. I've I've just been realizing. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of thoughts going on here, but like the whole idea of being present, which mindfulness is trying to get to, experience the sensations of things, and that you're um, you're just present to things, you know, so that you're you're aware and and when you when you touch something. You're in that moment of what it feels like when you taste something. You're in that moment of what it tastes like, and so on. You know, but I'm I'm increasingly realizing just just the this is just thing of cooking and eating. That's right yeah. there. You know, don't, yeah. don't do mindfulness. Just cook something and eat it, and then you realize that, that modern life is just rubbish because the, the, all we're trying to undo with gyms and mindfulness and drugs and everything else, mm -hmm. just trying to undo the fact that we've been cut off from everything. We're using these artificial means to, to make ourselves feel alive again. But actually, just the way people used to live, um, you kind of did feel alive. And yet that's supposed to be poor. You know, we need, we've got this development model that says what we need is to get all the rural poor <laughs> to, to actually live with all modern conveniences and move to the city and work in an office. I think, well... Anybody with any sense is actually moving in the opposite direction at the moment. Which is, guess what you've done? You used, to, you used to do office work, didn't you? Yeah, but I mean, it was interesting. It was pretty interesting and crazy, though. It wasn't. It was. It was mindful in a different way. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. It was interesting. So, what did you? What did you used to do? Uh, I was an investment banking lawyer in emerging markets, wow. and I probably about. 14 years of it, I was based in Asia. Isn't that? Isn't it was that, when capital markets were developing is amazingly fascinating. Wow. Isn't that kind of evil? Not at all. Really? I mean, you bring, you're bringing, so basically, back, back how, does, how, does, how, does, how did China be, get electricity, to, uh, their electric power company to get up and running? They can't get mo loans from a bank anymore. They have to access capital markets. So how do you get the company to have governance, to be able to have an appropriate accounting and a CEO, you know, you got to go through a whole process of getting credit rating, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually you could access the markets and boom, everyone can have electricity. How do you think that works? It works because you have to access funding somehow on a large scale, yeah. but you have to go from the way you've always been doing, which is either family oriented or whatever, and give some kind of governance to it if you want to access capital markets. So that's part of, 
the essence of what you're doing. So I think that's the other thing is that you need to understand both sides of it, Miles. You need to understand like there is, there are good things. There is a discipline and then there are good things that the imposition of that, you know, sort of capitalist discipline can do because it will, it, at some point it does shake out the slackers and the people who are blowhards, right? They just like talk, but they don't produce anything that is of value. So no one will pay for it. So therefore you go bankrupt at some point. Maybe sooner rather than later, maybe later than sooner, but it does impose a kind of discipline. Now, obviously, there's a balance. It can go out of whack where you've gone too far with the one side or the other. But to say the whole thing is evil, I think, is balanced, is unbalanced the other way. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go away and think about that. <laughs> so I've given you your tidbit for the day. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, I lived in Asia for a long time and people there did not want to, for the rest of their life, slave in the rice paddy, which is like pretty backbreaking work, right? So that you do, you you want to have a balance in between being in the field and being able to, you know, have have some health care, you know, modern health care, et cetera, or, or, you know, things that you want. You want to have some kind of balance. What about, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think we've both come from a, position of critique in the agricultural paradigm anyway um but <laughs> there's there's um so like backbreaking work being part of it you know the idea that you have to force the the land to produce something almost yeah. its will but as opposed to just gathering the good of the land which is which is a lot less effort um maybe certainly isn't no effort but it's yes yeah. you're just you're you're working with what's coming rather than trying to make something happen but um it's an interesting thing with that that rice cultivation paradigm, because of course, when when people revert to traditional methods, you you have a lot of other stuff in the rice paddy. You know, you have insects and fish and frogs and and also wild uh, vegetables in there. I would imagine that that in itself makes it less backbreaking, doesn't it? If if um... yes, well, actually, I was in southern Thailand earlier this year. And all in the markets, they had this, and don't, I don't remember the Latin name, so don't, I can send it to you later, but I forgot, okay? okay. So, yeah. but I found this, in the markets, they had this plant. I was like, oh my God, what is this? It's so interesting, you know? And it was, what it was, was it's a wild plant that is invading the rice paddies. And so instead of just being like, oh, what do we do? Do we like spray it or whatever? They looked into it, found out it was good to eat, and guess where it comes from? The United States. That's hilarious. Yes. And so it's become invasive in all the patties, and they figured out it's good to eat. So they're selling it like crazy in the markets when I was there. And by the way, it's delicious. Well, talk about not breaking your back. I mean, <laughs> about something that grows in spite of the fact you're trying to stop it from growing, which is the total opposite to working like crazy to, to create the conditions in which something will grow and pulling out all the other things that's trying to compete with it. This thing just goes, hello, I'm here, and I've come to stay, and there's lots of me. That's amazing. Why don't we be enterprising and be, use our creativity to figure out what to do instead of like, oh no, no, I have it, everything has to fill everything has to fit into my rubric of like, I want to have this little design and this plan, and everything has to go according to the plan, right? I'm not sure if your in investment banker thing is going to be the 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 the, uh, the light that switches on in my brain in this conversation. I think. <laughs> I love just did switch on in my brain um, when you just said that. Use our creativity. Now, I've been w working with this um, contrast of agriculture versus hunting and gathering. Really? Okay, uh, let's talk about that because I, I can tell you some interesting things that are happening. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd love to hear them. But just, just, just to say what, what your statement there has provoked in my mind, I've been thinking, well, why is the hunter-gatherer thing so good? Because it works with rather than against – you know, it's it's not an equal power relationship between us and land, and and it, and it keeps everything in context, even though we develop the context, but we're not taking things out of context and therefore causing the complex organic system to break down. But what I've never thought about before is that the hunter-gatherer thing flourishes and thrives because of creativity. So that's yeah. And, and if we're looking forward to, to 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 a change in the future now from where we are now. What we need is creativity. So. And to circle back, to circle back to where we started, why am I working with this smaller group of, you know, chefs slash pastry people slash bartenders? Because 
the people I'm working with are super into being creative. They're not just satisfied with making the same strawberries after 25 years, right? They're tired of that. They are looking. So why not have a community of people? You know, I'm not the only person and these, you know, that are innovative, creative and know how to make things delicious, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, well, I guess the, the, the context that we're in now is that there's far more opportunity to touch on what people are doing all over the place now yes. with, yeah. with, with the, that is the plus side that I, um, so do you want to hear my agriculture versus hunter gatherer? Please. Anecdote. Okay. So this is happening now. It's actually happening like, and I won't use any names or anything, okay, but it is happening right now as in the, as in the last seven days. Okay. So, um, one of the places, so I have different land that I lease and some that I own and some that I have agreements with, et cetera, but all within a certain rubric of kind of sustainability and invasive plants versus indigenous plants, et cetera. So this particular place is that I am working on um, is owned by a municipality, and, uh, but they they're have a, a preserve, a wild preserve around this. So it, you, this part of the land was agriculturally zoned, but they don't want to have in the middle of this preserve some kind of like, you know, scorched earth, you know, cornfield or something. So they want it to be, it's already been organic certified, blah, blah, blah. So they asked if I, but farmers couldn't work with it because it doesn't have any irrigation. There's no place to put heavy meat machinery. So they actually asked if I would lease this from them and keep up the organic certification. Um, which has been kind of interesting because the language that's being used by the organic certification and this, the person who's in charge of this municipality um, pr preservation is an ecologist, like a PhD ecologist. So the language and the lack of kind of like meshing, it's very <laughs> interesting as the person kind of in the middle. So for example, um, there is a definition in the US laws for wild crafting that you can actually have farmland you can do, but what that particular land doesn't fit the definition, the federal definition of wild crafting, because at one point it was farmed and it can only be like a forest, right? So it's like kind of crazy because it's totally wild crafting, but it's, you're not allowed to call it that. So then you have to call it crops. And under the definition of crops, you have to do all this stuff, like amend the soil and blah, 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 and bring in like, you know, organic matter to increase fertility, which of course isn't great for a lot of, right? Native yeah, yeah. and so, they are recommending that where you are, have you brought in, you know, mulch and grass clippings. And then this director of the municipality is <laughs> sending these messages back saying that is exactly contrary to what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. We think the soil as it is, is just exactly what these plants that want to grow there want. And it's increasing biodiversity. We've seen huge increase in pollinators. It's magical, right? And this is exactly what we want. And we're what being are you or what are you not doing? Because when you're saying things are increasing, as a result of what are things are increasing? Um, light management. So what instead of like tilling, um, we are mowing like maybe depending on the weather. It's about every other year to keep because we want to keep it as an open space. Um, as opposed to a forest, because its edges and its open spaces attract different types of things. Um, and it's very interesting to see the types of plants that are cropping up um, that were never seen there before. Um, and where they were suppressing some of the more um, uh, difficult, quite noxious invasive plants like mugwort, artemisia, right, uh, vulgaris, and things like that, which could affect the biodiversity. So that's kind of light management. Um, but it's just an interesting, and the dialogue is continuing, Miles. <laughs> They're sending these emails like, well, no, this is exactly what, so, it, but, it's, but I think this is a necessary dialogue, but it's interesting to see how both are trying to do good for people in the environment, but we're in our own buckets, you know? Yeah, well, the good thing about that is you'll have a new bucket by the end of it, won't you? I don't know, we'll see. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> a, merger, a bucket merger like there must be a, well you've got to have a new bucket because you'll have an approach that is neither one yeah, or the I other mean, I, I have done I do do propagation so on certain places like so I call it wild farm right where you're actually are propagating something but it's something that was would 
would you would have seen there if not for you know people cutting everything down and making a lawn or making it you know something else so things that you would see and and in for, from an ecological perspective you call it you know restoration so it's habitat restoration or something that's what the category is and then but if you're if it's if you're propagating it it's something that you can actually also use for production um it's kind of like a wild farm because you're not farming it in kind of rows with like plastic mulch under it you know yeah. you're letting the community of plants that would normally come in come in that would want to be around these plants um so that's i mean i'm not saying i've perfected this but that's kind of what i'm working on in terms yeah, of exactly. in between yeah because i mean i, I suppose the thing you know, we got this whole rewilding thing that's very big in in uh, Europe at the moment. Okay. And I don't agree with it because it's it's just it's a mistake in terms of how people are thinking about it. In my opinion, like that. What is it? Well, it's basically people saying, "Yeah, sorry, I should say what it is." So rewilding is is where you're just letting land go back to what it would be if we weren't here. I think that's the basic idea. And yeah, I don't agree with that at all because. We are here, and and we have been here, and you know the the human impacts on um, on land and and other species is, in my opinion, is so, twofold. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it's the industrial um, human is just wrecking everything, but the hunter gatherer human has overall done done more um, benefit to ecology and biodiversity um, than. So you're saying. Yeah, that so. the, in the re are you saying just so I can understand that the rewilding um, initiative, the definition of wild is that people cannot touch it? Yeah, kind of, yeah. And it's, okay. and the basic perspective is anti-human. It's like it's like Catholic guilt applied to ecology. You know. You know the, <laughs> okay, it, not it, too familiar with Catholic guilt. <laughs> okay. well, you know, just like the idea of original sin. You know, we're just fundamentally flawed. You know, we're just horrible. You know, humans are just bad. And 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 so th what 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 nature needs is for us to leave, you know. So, right. So never touch. It, they cannot coexist. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the idea that that, which is the one that I'm working with, which is that in ecological terms we are a keystone species, where we are in our ecological niche in a landscape. The land thrives and flourishes, and so does everything else. Same as you know walls back in Yellowstone National Park. I'm saying let's get humans back into planet Earth, you know, and, and let the thing flourish again. Because the point is we're out, you know. We we were in and now we're out. We're like here, but we're not here. We're and, and we're like this blot on the landscape because our non presence is the thing that sabotages the global ecology. The non presence, you know. So what I'm saying is let's be present and let's see that like ecology producing uh a flourishing of resources that we can make use of well that's that's more like it so when you when you're there making that landscape productive but also managing it for biodiversity that's perfect you know that's uh, um but i think what it what it what it generates for me is questions mm -hmm. which which i've been working with and having conversations with other people about you know about what what is our issue actually with agriculture what what is our right. problem and where's the line crossed and when is farming not farming or, or when is it something that is actually in line with the kind of relationship that hunter gatherers had so that like the, the Aboriginal relationship mm -hmm. is, is, you know, in a lot of ways you say, well, it is farming. Like in Australia, they took the uh, plants that were growing along the rivers in Western Australia, Southwestern Australia, and they just stacked the odds in favor of certain very useful plants. Like there's a daisy, I think it's a daisy yam. I think that's what it is. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a root crop on the riverbanks, and they just encouraged it at the exactly, yeah, yeah. But it's still in context; it's still the wild species. And then they have this massive crop every year is that farming? And according to my definition, no, because to me, the the the, the crucial beef that I realize I have with agriculture is that it's out of context. So you are not you are disrupting this context by bringing stuff here and doing this. The context that was here in terms of the wild ecology and the biodiversity can no longer happen because you're doing this here instead. And then also you're taking the plant out of the context of its its own gene pool. Yeah. So, 
to something else. Now, there can be benefits to that. Some plants are definitely more nutritious as a result. Mm. And I say I can argue with that. But mm. like, you know, beetroot and carrots are far more nutritious than the wild ones in some respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my basic beef is the decontextualization of, of land and species. That's the beef I've got. So if you're there in a place where something was in the first place, mm -hmm. you're just being an active species. I don't call that farming. I'm saying you, you're helping that stuff be there that was there. So you're not taking anything out of context. You're, you're, you're making that context flourish more with more biodiversity and more biomass. For my, in my definition of it, that's not farming or agriculture. That's, that's, that's hunter-gathering still. But, yeah. So here, I would say people use the word stewardship. You hear that word a lot, stewardship, right? So we're stewarding the land. Like you're managing something, but as a steward, you know, not, not as, you know, a farmer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're working with it. You're working with what's there. You're not. Right. right. I just think it's great, like, to, to, to hear about that example and to know that people are tinkering with, with not just these ideas, but, like, what happens when you, when you actually do stuff along the idea. I think it. I mean, I. I think it is. It's very interesting. So this conversation. I've never had so many conversations with with farmers. It, and the farmers or organization has now contacted me, and they're like, "Well, we need to contact you because we hear your name every week." And I was like, "You good?" Or like, "In what context?" I was a little nervous about that. But you know, there are, people are interested in looking for things. So I thought that's kind of good. But I mean, obviously, there's a lot of logistical and execution. Um, it, it's going to require different types of skills, like you said. It's a di you know to to pick something as a steward or harvester is different than you know running a plow through it. So it requires it it requires you know a different type of skills, et cetera. But the fact that conversations are starting is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I just yeah I think that just the convergence of the need to produce or access resources and the need to stop destroying everything, that, that we can reach this point of insight where we go, ah, we can do both at the same time. <laughs> yeah, then people get excited. Yeah, people get excited. They get excited. And in actual fact, it's, it's, um, it's fulfilling uh, the, the aims of the Convention on Biodiversity, which nobody seems to really remember is a thing, but it is a thing. Like the Rio Summit back in 1992 – most of the world's governments signed up to this thing. And if, if oh, you really? don't know, or just for the sake of people listening, I'll, I'll say what the three aims are. Aim number one is to preserve genetic resources, in other words, species. It's just a way of saying species. But aim number two, which you just hear nothing about, is, is, that, is that we develop sustainable uses for genetic resources. The idea being, what's the best method to, to preserve genetic resources, create an economic use for it, because then the, 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 the enmeshment of that species within economic life and yeah. biological life of human beings means that we're not going to just let it be destroyed. We just think, well, hang on. So what ought to have happened at that point it was like a, a scanning device to go through the whole of creation, right, looking at every single genetic resource and saying, what is this good for? You know, and, if, and if it's just got a little bit of this kind of molecule in it, we think, well, we're not sure what that would be good for at the moment, but those kind of molecules are actually really helpful in general. So let's make sure that one doesn't get lost. And just this general perspective that we would get if we were doing that, that we can't afford to lose a thing. We can't afford to lose anything. Oh, okay. I think for some people, the argument's hard to make, you know. Why do we have to preserve everything? You know, it, it, it seems like sentimentality, you know, that, that we, just, we just want to hold on to it because it's beautiful or it's inherently valuable and things like that. You know that. I mean, I totally agree with that. We should hang. <laughs> this beautiful. We should hang on to it because it's inherently valuable. But the problem is getting getting the the, the government and and the masses that that don't necessarily yeah. see all of it as beautiful. They just yeah. think, you know, I need a job. Why should that be more important than me having a job and being able to feed my family? But if if we if we if we recognise that all of those species, when we talk about biodiversity. All of those species are actually part of this fabric of life, which is what it boils down to. In a way, you don't even need to do that scanning exercise. But if you understand that, this is all part of the fabric of life. And if the fabric of life breaks down, we're screwed. But like I think in, 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 in terms of us practically weaving ourselves back into the fabric of life, 
every time we recognize that something is, is good for something, we create a, potentially create a relationship with it, and therefore we anchor it. Anyway, the point the point I was going to make is that is that we um, we see a convergence of those two things in that second aim, right? When we say yeah. develop sustainable use for genetic resources, we're saying it's both. People mm -hmm. need stuff, and at the moment, with the way that we're getting stuff is wrecking everything. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's all these species that are in danger of going extinct, and most of them probably are able to supply some of the things that we need, which at the moment we're getting through this industrial paradigm that's wrecking everything. So why don't we actually look to the genetic resources to be the source of everything we need, or as much as possible of everything we need, and then the very act of going to get what we need will be the act of preserving the stuff that's in danger of going extinct. So I mean, I think that was that. So that's that's it's been much bandied around the the term sustainable development. Yeah. Meaning yeah. the thing that people use to justify getting money to waste on things and, and right. yeah, I know. green when you're not. But actually, the idea behind sustainable development is genius. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's basically, I'm just thinking now of what you said. It's using our creativity to learn how to exist here in a way that gets to all the good stuff without destroying it. You know, like, that's sustainable development. <laughs> Um, and I wish you could. You, I wish I could have taken a photo of your face at that. I know that this is a podcast because you're. You could see how excited you were, and you're just uh, like, yes, that's what I have to do. So I'll tell you, like, this one. I'm very focused on the one project that I'm doing, and it is again, as you know, you talk. We talked about aimed at getting in the economic life of people, right? Yeah. And you know, what I'm really trying to do though is to try and move the needle, like, you know, those aims that you talked about. So how do we actually move that needle even a little bit because once it starts to get momentum the move the needle starts to move so the project that i'm working on which i've been working on for a decade is you know I, uh, one of my favorite things to forage is sumac it's an indigenous tree and it's not the mediterranean it's, it's the flavor proof profile from all my clients 100 percent is a superior because it's got cherry notes it's tart well people I don't know how these things get started in miles, but people in the United States, they've got it in their brain that all the sumac that you see growing like a weed is poison sumac, right? I don't know why. Okay, they all think it's poison sumac. So you see along one of the largest highway corridors and people's farmers, they're all like killing it. They're spraying anything you could do. Oh, let's, let's get rid of it. And actually it is starting to decline where you're looking for it because – the hedgerows are going, you know, there's invasive plant, grape, uh, there's grapes and all kinds of vines growing over it. And, you know, deer browse on the shoots. And so it is actually starting to decline. It's a fantastic tree, you know, and I, I know people use this words like permaculture and stuff. So this would be the, the ultimate, you know, weed tree pump permaculture, except for people don't value it, right? It's all around them. So I now have a sumac tea. It's a bottled drink, right? People, it's shelf stable. So people, I'm planning. I, we did a proof of concept. It's a huge amount of work. Um, but now, if you could offer it, and somebody, I actually was talking to some dairy farmers who have this, and I gave them a bottle, and they're like, "Okay, I don't have to lecture or do anything. They just drink it. And they're like, oh, this poison sumac is delicious. So they're still calling it poison sumac. But in that moment, right?" Without anyone lecturing or saying anything or having it, they have realized one that has a value that has that that has an economic value, right? And two, wait, it's obviously not poison because I just drank it. Yeah. So that, you know I, that to me, that's how you you know we're both in business, but business can help move that needle in a way that people can see it, and you can, you get beyond just the people you're talking to. What do you think? Yeah, no, I love, it. but I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about the lecture that wasn't a lecture, though, because the, 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 <laughs> you, you, you did give them a lecture. <laughs> I'm give you a lecture today. <laughs> and didn't say a word, and you stood there, and 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 the bottle put their thinking straight, and at the end of it, they said, "I see what you mean." <laughs> but you know, because I think one of the issues that we're, that at least we see here, I don't know, is that 
people are not talking to each other. They're talking at each other, and there's different groups, and blah, blah, blah. And so this is like nobody has to talk. They can just drink it and enjoy. Yeah. I don't know. If, and you've won the argument with that. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to go away and work with that idea. I love the idea of a, of, of a wordless lecture in a bottle. Yes, right? And you said, you know, and then people see it. So yeah. there's something going on there, you know, that the, the, you gave them something to drink and they saw something. Yeah, uh, they still call it poison. <laughs> <laughs> still call it. And, and, and the other thing is the value, like you use the word value, which I think is incredibly important because that's, that's the shift that's happening, you know, that the, the, the thing that is perceived to be worthless is, um, is being perceived to be of extreme value. Um, and I guess, I mean, that's a personal, it's probably a personal thing for me where I, I mean, I think I'm just very focused on things that are discarded, undervalued, and actually I think are sometimes the better things, you know, just all kinds of things from food ways to this, to people, to whatever. We're not, you know, it's, it's, we're not looking to see where the true values are. Well, I, I mean, I, I suppose it, it, the, the point is that the values, are, the, currently the values are completely topsy-turvy, aren't they? You know, and, um, and so, when something starts happening that that corrects that, you know, that, that you see, you know, because fame and money, for example, are perceived to be really valuable. Convenience is seen to be really valuable. Um, I don't know. We could we could come go for a list, I guess. But but you know, appearance is seen to be. You know, if you look good, that's seen to be really valuable. And and yet, under the surface, we see that people have empty lives when they look good. And there's a bunch of shabby looking scruffy people <laughs> who who don't come across very well. Mm -hmm. And yet they're actually amazing. Um and right. and, and if right. you took the time, you'd mm -hmm. learn a whole bunch of stuff about how to be a, a good human, you know, from, from from those people. So like it's the inversion of um of, of this, this distorted value system. But um yeah, I don't know. I just think that's interesting work to be doing, to just to, to be shifting the price tags around, you know. Yeah, but you could. I mean, you're, you know, like the foremost foraging business in the UK. I'm sure you could use your creativity and have some really interesting things that would help move the needle. Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess, where, yeah, where I'm at at the moment is, I, I feel, you know, in a lot of ways that, that we have moved the needle in, in a lot of mm -hmm. uh, the plants that are now... They are valued, so so that's that's really um, the first part of the jigsaw puzzle, as it were. That, that you know, like the restaurant puts mm -hmm. chickweed and and so on on the menu. Yeah, it previously was just seen as just this rubbish that you yank out and throw on your, your compost heap. But um, I guess that's that's a sort of ongoing situation because I think now we're moving into a phase where people are recognizing another layer of the value you know like the, the, okay. the nutrition and the and the other health benefits of eating wild stuff mm -hmm. uh, which is funnily enough that's not coming through the restaurants They're, yeah to be yeah. particularly interested in that side of things at least not not in the uk health and nutrition and fine dining and it's weird because actually when you go out and eat in a fine dining restaurant you've got a low carb situation you've got very high quality protein yeah amazing vegetable. they could be marketing that as as a very healthy Dining mm -hmm. experience, but it, that doesn't seem to have joined up yet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's certainly not just about opulence and luxury and, and right. unhealthy food anymore. Which, which, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some some very expensive restaurants you would have probably mm -hmm. been less healthy as a result of eating there in the mm -hmm. past, and now now it's not true. But um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the thing the thing about the value the the, the thing about the value is I think the most important thing for us uh, globally in terms of this reversal of values is the, uh, the value that needs to be put on indigenous um, cultures because, I mean, that's, that's, this is an absolute emergency in terms of what's going on in Brazil at the moment, that, 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 that you've got um, a large part of the population that are still buying into this idea that, that these people out in the jungle are just wasting it, you know. And that's the same thing that happened in, in, in your country 
when the settlers arrived, you know, I just can't believe that thing is now being rerun so successfully. You know, all the white settlers said, you know, these indigenous people are wasting the land. It's, it's, it's only fair that we push them off because, you know, this is God's good creation and we're supposed to farm it. Mm -hmm. You've got the same sort of forces at work in Brazil now. Evangelical Christians um, are, are the driving force behind that. You know, they're, they're, they're saying like, you know, this forest is, is good farmland. And these, mm -hmm. this small group of people have, have uh, the right to be here when, you know, there's loads of people in Brazil. We should be allowed to go in there and farm it and share the benefits with everyone. And the, and the only reason they're able to say that is because no one is seeing the value of this precious relationship that people are still managing to have in the 21st century, that they can actually live in balance with, with a wild ecosystem. And, and, and the, thing, the thing flourishes and they flourish. That's the thing I think that is, that is um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, we're sort of edging towards that being the thing that people understand. But the fact that there's still... Uh, indigenous lands being lost as we speak in the face of that worldview that, that, that gives absolutely no value to, to the um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're in trouble in that sense because yeah you know, I mean all links in like it's the, that's, the, that's the other front you've got, you've got the extreme weather front um, thing going on but then just down just down south there you've got the forest is burning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in like so, you know so it, it's not just an ecological crisis like it's it's what's driving the crisis mm -hmm. what's driving the crisis is people people not having their values straight basically that that, that um we don't just know you know that like to to put your feet on the land and and be a part of that as indigenous people always have done you know is is um well you know i don't know if you if you're watching the news but like we've got we've got the big climate protests going on in london um at the moment they're they're bringing the Today. For two weeks, we've got climate protests in London. Um, Other yeah. news that's been hitting our news feed over here. <laughs> you're not you're not been getting any of that, no. Not really. It's it's never, believe me. It's crowded with other things. <laughs> well, I guess that's yeah, that's it. But but anyway, that's what's happening. There's thousands of people in London gluing themselves to government buildings and really padlocking themselves to vehicles and blocking the roads and 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 stopping the streets and just and in a sense it's very good because this it, it's a new kind of movement like protest because they're having a party mm -hmm. smiling faces there's dancing there's music there's children mm -hmm. and it's not a bunch of scruffy hippies these are just very you know there's a lot of very ordinary people that realize if we don't make the government do something about climate change we won't have a planet you know and um and so that's um that's uh that's going on as we speak. It's, it's, it's exciting stuff, actually. Yeah. Oh, it's, good. it's good to um, exchange thoughts and hear about what you're doing. It sounds really interesting. Yeah. It's difficult to know how to stop this now because... <laughs> I know. Well, I, I actually feel like this is really... It's good, but now it's like, okay, so now we don't talk to each other for like another eight years, you know, or whatever. I mean, I know you get really busy, but at least email me. Like, what's going on with, you know, these things we talked about? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, seriously, it, it is it is an issue around um, keeping in touch with people. But to be honest, this 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 podcast is kind of an excuse to to make sure I talk to people. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm glad. Thank you for thinking of me. Yeah, yeah. You know? Thanks, Miles. So let me know if you've come up with any other farming or other types of rubrics that would be. You kind of know what I what I'm thinking of, and so if you think of anything that might be useful, just send it along. Yeah, and. I mean, I would, I would say, listen, listen to the podcast regularly because this sort of thing comes up a lot. You know, okay. I mean, I guess you're in touch with Samuel Thayer, are you? Yeah, on and off. Yeah, usually I contact him in like the winter, winter time. He does a, he does a mean hickory oil. Cool. He's doing a lot. Of, he's doing these oil pressing things. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah. No, he talked about that on the, on the thing. Yeah, that's that sounds good. You know the podcast. The, the the name of the podcast, World Wild, is actually I'm I'm getting this project off the ground, which which mm -hmm. which which is of the same name, World Wild. And the idea is to have some kind of infrastructure that connects people, and, mm -hmm. and you know, like a global database, for example, or I don't know. I'm I'm just it's brewing, but it but it's a way for all of the um, various projects to somehow have a way of. Um, mm -hmm. 
coordinating activities, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and also just to get funding to try and um, maybe even have that foragers conference we talked about. Um, well, that may we may that may happen. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, world the the idea of the world wild is to is to um, is to have some kind of face or entity mm -hmm. that, that pulls together all the threads in a way that that, that makes them more of an accessible. Mm -hmm resource or more of a coordinated effort you know so so you yeah, kind of watch this space yeah okay that's good all right then well good to talk to you and hey. yeah i promise we'll talk sooner than <laughs> years or whatever it was <laughs> <laughs> thanks take care have a great day and you bye bye well another day another dollar another week another podcast conversation and it does make me think about all of these different people that we talk to every week and they're all in a certain context and interesting things happening and, and um, connections being made and, and change happening too. Um, you know, as I speak, there's people out on the street in London. Um, we're getting up there tomorrow with some watercress to help feed um, the protesters or the rebels as everyone's wishing to be called. And uh, there's a lot of change kind of feeling like it's in the air, lots of things stirring. Um, and I guess it just makes me think of what we do um, when we get out and forage, that we're responding to the wild landscape and things that emerge kind of of their own vol volition. And, um, yeah, I guess the thing is, how do we, you know, how do we work with that? The, the idea that we touched on in, in the conversation that you've just listened to about, you know, instead of farming and forcing things to happen, that, that we work with what's already happening and cause it to flourish and thrive. And, um, you know, I think that's what's going on with the Extinction Rebellion movement is people have obviously thought long and hard about what, 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 what does it take rather than to, you know, have some kind of bloody revolution that imposes a new world order um, by coercive means. What does it take to work with people's de desires and people's intentions and see uh, – everybody kind of move to collaborate because you're working with um, what's in the heart and soul of everybody. So it's a bit like foraging is what I'm trying to say. And, and, and all these different projects like what's going on with Tama and, you know, Sam Thayer and Fred Preventer and all the, all the other characters that we've spoken to. Um, there's kind of a life that's an impetus that makes people connect with ideas and connect with plants and connect with culture and, you know, as soon as we start connecting, the, the, there is an emergence. There's a, the sort of thing that um, brings itself into being in the same way as a wild plant brings itself into being without being, um, you know, acted upon by anybody else in any direct way. They just kind of emerge. So, yeah, I mean, with the, the, the climate emergency emphasis of the whole Extinction Rebellion protest that's going on at the moment, and, I mean, that's just a fact, I guess, What's happening is that the fact is being pointed at, and I think there's a sort of a retreat, really, of the of the of the denial, at least in people that are, um, in any sense, conscious. You know that we're we're, we're realizing that, uh, that this is this is happening now. It is an emergency. What I'm trying to get to here is that alongside the the protests, kind of blasting out on a trumpet, it's an emergency and getting everybody's attention and and rallying you know for for action especially governments acting as as people act to to say that they demand change they demand that we still have a planet in 100 years time and so on so that's kind of, kind of like a, a a negative thing to well it's a negative thing to address the fact that there's a negative thing happening in terms of climate change but the positive thing that i think we we also have to emphasize rather than climate emergency, we need an emerge and see where we, we see what's emerging and we look at how we work with what's emerging in terms of the good things that's happening with people connecting with plants and places and, and culture and ideas. Um, because I think that's where the strength lies. You know, we've, we've got this kind of death dealing um, situation where our reliance on mechanisms and machines and so on has it's got us into the trouble that we're in. But we can also look and see what's what's happening when life reconnects. Because I'm firmly convinced, however desperate the situation seems with regard to climate change and uh, species loss and all the other issues that we're up against, that life is stronger than uh, these forces of, of kind of mechanization and, and, and kind of death in a way. 
Okay, well, that's um, just some thoughts that kind of off the back of what we talked about today, um, but also the, the time in which we are with the, um, the protests going on. I thought it would be good to have some reflections on that. So that's it. That's it for this week. 